Welcome everybody. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Marco. Hello. Welcome everyone. As you come in, please sign into the chat box with your first and last name and the name of your organization. Welcome. Welcome. Please sign in to the chat box with your first and last name and the name of your organization. I'm going to give it a few minutes while people are still joining us. We had about 67 people registered, so we have 19 on so far. All right, welcome everyone. Brittany, I just saw an email with your guys' name on it about the RFP for apprenticeship programs going out today. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's the first time I've heard of your organization, so I'm interested in learning more. <laughs> we actually just went through a name change. We were ResCare um, oh. services before, yeah. I know who that is, <laughs> okay. We just keep everybody on their toes now. No one knows okay. what's going on. <laughs> okay, good to know. Uh, but yeah, I definitely want to hear more about that program. Welcome, everybody. Please sign into the chat box with your first and last name and uh, the name of your organization. Gabriel, do you... Uh, are you familiar with the pilot program with Chrysalis in LA County on the CalFresh program? Yeah, I've I've been in uh, a few meetings to uh, get familiar with that. It's been some time since um, I've gotten information on that, but I'm relatively familiar with it. Okay, will you drop your, your email address in the chat box so I can grab that? I'm gonna reach out to you. Um, okay. Orange County is wanting some additional information on that. Sounds Welcome good. everybody. Thank you for joining us. Please sign into the chat with your first and last name and the name of your organization. Thank you, Gabriel. I'm going to give it one more minute. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Annette Kelly. I'm the uh, regional organizer for the Orange Regional Pro um, Planning Unit. And I'm going to start off with just a, kind of a general presentation about the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act and um, our planning process here. And then we will just kind of move into some questions um, about just general workforce questions. Um, 
we've already had several of these meetings and most of them were kind of focused on a specific population. So this one's kind of more open to anything we want to talk about. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started and we'll do introductions kind of midway just so that we can allow more people to get on and then uh, do those inter introductions. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to make, make sure I'm sharing the right one here. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about the future of workforce and what that what that might look like for us, you guys, which is sometimes a scary thought to me. But anyway, so um, so the three boards in the Orange RPU are funded under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, the main vision of this act is to strengthen and improve our nation's public workforce system and help get Americans, including youth and those with significant barriers to employment, into high quality jobs and careers and help employers hire and retain skilled workers. Um, when this act, it, it uh, superseded the WIA Workforce Innovation, Workforce Investment Act, excuse me. And um, this one really focused on uh, stronger partnerships and a structured delivery system that really, um, really focused on, again, the partners and making sure that it was seamless for those who are accessing services, as well as providing services to employers, um, and then kind of regional, focusing on those regional economies. Um, the act did expire already, so they we're running on a uh, extension that goes in, uh, until this year, and so We'll see what happens with the new administration as they come in. Um, so there are three key pillars, one of them being just to provide excellent customer service through our, one cop our comprehensive one-stop centers. Um, this is where most of our job seekers access those access services for um, employment and training. So that is one of the three key pillars. Also, businesses and workers drive workforce solutions. So we want to listen to those businesses and workers in identifying the programs that we focus on, as well as the system supports strong regional economies. And I'll kind of get into how that works in California here. Um, there are 45 workforce development areas throughout the state of California, and they are divided into 15 regional planning units. And in, in this area, we have three boards in the Orange Regional Planning Unit. So it's the Orange County, Santa Ana, and Anaheim Workforce Development Board. And currently we are in our regional and local planning process. We do this every four years and every two years there is a uh, plan update. So um, currently um, on the regional plan, we that plan is basically going to articulate how the RPU will build intentionality around industry sector engagement, drive workforce development, and expand on-ramps to career pathways. And then the local plans basically provide an action plan for operationalizing the roadmap laid out in the regional plan. It describes how individuals access services through the centers and how we partner with um, our core required partners and additional partners as well. So there are core program partners and required partners. And so under Title I is uh, federal workforce development funding that is what the boards use basically to prepare low-income adults, youth, and dislocated workers for employment. Um, and Job Corps, Youth Build, Native American programs, and my migrant seasonal farm worker programs are also funded under Title I programs. And then you have Title II programs, which is funding for adult education, uh, literacy funding, English language learner services, also Title III programs, which fund the Wagner Pizer Employment Services Program, which is run by Employment Development Department. And that assists job seekers in finding employment and facilitating the match between job seekers and employers. And then you have Title IV programs, um, 
which are vocational rehab programs. And then Title V is senior community service programs. So these are core and required partners and then additional partners include career technical education, um, programs under Jobs for Veterans state grants, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development programs, we have Second Chance Act programs and Temporary Assistance for Needy Family programs, along with a host of other partners. <laughs> but um, these, are, these are our required partners. And during the two-year modification, um, we had new partnerships that we developed and then we enhanced partnerships with a couple of our existing partners. So two of the new ones were the CalFresh um, employment and training programs and then new partnership with local child support agencies in serving non-custodial parents. And then our enhanced programs, um, partnerships were with Department of Rehab and that focus was on improving um, services to those with disabilities and implementing competitive and in integrated employment models, and then enhanced partnerships in serving those who were English language learners, foreign born individuals and refugees. So I'm gonna stop right here and we're gonna do some introductions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So welcome again, everybody. Um, for those of you who are just joining, please sign into the chat box with your first and last name and the name of your organization. Um, my name is Annette Kelly Whittle. I'm the regional organizer for the Orange Planning Unit. Um, so I'm going to start in my corner here with Derek. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us um, about your organization? Hi, Annette. Thank you for hosting this meeting today. Um, I'm Derek Mendes, a job developer with AtNet and working wardrobes. I see I've met a few of you on the call here. So thank you all for coming today. Good to see old faces, even if it's a little square. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're a grantee of the HVRP uh, program. Um, let's see, this last year we helped deploy 65 individuals, uh, veterans and their families, uh, regardless of uh, like the fire that we had last February and uh, during COVID times. Uh, so if you have any homeless veterans or anybody looking for jobs, uh, spouses of veterans, children of veterans, uh, just send them on over to uh, Working War Jobs and FatNet. More than happy to help out who we can. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Sitalali. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Sitalali Damond, and I am a Granting Programs Administrator with OC Community Services, Community Investment Division. Thank you. Tanya? Hi, greetings everyone. My name is Tanya Muniton and I work with Goodwill of Orange County and we provide services and we have several range programs from um, job training to job coaching placement and more. Thank you. Thank you. Bryn? Hi, I'm Bryn Hernandez. I'm a business solutions coordinator with the County of Orange Community Services Department and Community Investment Division. Thank you. Marco? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Marco Lucero with the uh, City of Anaheim Workforce Development Board. Thank you. Anne? Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Pham, and I am with the Doe Education Program at Coastline College. Thank you. Daniel? Hi, my name is Daniel Nofre. Um, with the State of California uh, Workforce Services Branch out of the Orange County One Stop Center in Garden Grove. Welcome, thank you. Gabriel? Good afternoon, my name is Gabriel Salceda. I am the Business Development Manager for Chrysalis. Thank, thank you. you. Trina? Good afternoon, everyone. My Trina Fleming, I'm with WHW, also known as Women Helping Women. We provide a full array of employment support services to support unemployed and underemployed women, men, and teens throughout. Thank you. Victoria? Hello, my name is Victoria Rivet, and I'm the Education Director at the Recovery Education Institute, also known as REI, in Orange. Thank you. Erin? 
Hello, I'm Erin Yulaberry with the County of Orange, um, OC Community Services, um, along with Brennan Zapelli. Thank you. Thank you. Araceli? Hi, everyone. Araceli Delgado with the Santa Ana Work Center, Business Services Rep. We serve the community of Santa Ana, placing them in jobs, vocational training, and we also offer virtual events. Thank you. Brian? Sorry about that, I couldn't find my unmute. My name is Brian Dozer, I'm the president of Vitalink. Uh, we are a nonprofit that helps um, students uh, find their um, college and career passions. Thank you. Brittany? Hi everyone, I'm Brittany Stevens. I am a um, supervisor overseeing our business solutions consultants with Equus Works. Equus Workforce Solutions, it's a mouthful. Um, we used to be ResCare Workforce Services. We recently just had a name change back in July. Thank you. Kanisha? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kanisha Humphrey. I am a career navigator through our Reentry to Success program at Working Wardrobes. I work with individuals who are formerly incarcerated or what we like to call justice involved. Um, we work with individuals over the age of 18 that reside in the Orange County area. So if you have anyone that you feel might be interested in receiving our services, um, please feel free to reach out to, to us and we'd be more than happy to help. And I can also um, include my information in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Nguyen. I'm a manager with the County of Orange Social Services, Family Self-Sufficiency and Adult Services Program um, in Policy and Quality Assurance. Thank you. Tom? Um, hi, uh, Tom Lay uh, with the Workforce Services of EDD. Thank you. Lisa? Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Delia. I'm the Director of Development for County. Thank you. Amelia? Hi there, everybody. My name is Amelia Cuevas, and I'm a job placement specialist for North Orange County ROP. I mainly work with youth, and um, I'm starting to start working with adults also pretty soon. Thank you. Maribel? Hi, my name is Maribel Sorabi, and I'm with Community Action Partnership of Orange County. Thank you, Maribel. Rhonda? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rhonda Dorsey. I'm one of the managers uh, at Equus Workforce Solutions, and I also work with Brittany. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Hi, my name is Cynthia Solis, and I'm with the Outreach and Engagement Program over at the Priority Center. Thank you, welcome. Michael? Hi, I'm Michael Scott. I'm the Director of Adult Education at Coastline College. Thank you. And I have one last person, but I just see a phone number. So it's 207478. <laughs> okay. Anybody else that I missed? My squares kind of jumped around. So, all right. Hi, this is our Arturo Casares from the Regional Center of Orange County. We provide uh, services to people with developmental disabilities in Orange County and uh, for adults that includes employment preparation, uh, employment development, and ongoing job coaching as well. Thank you, Arturo. All right. I'm share my screen again. Um, All right, so just the objectives of this community um, and stakeholder meeting is basically just to give everyone the opportunity to weigh in on, on the needs of workforce. Again, this one is pretty general. We're not focusing, focusing on any target population for this particular meeting. Um, we wanna learn from practitioners about best practices and meeting service needs, identify where gaps in services may currently exist, and hear recommendations on building and or strengthening services and programs to address currently unmet needs. 
We are planning for the 2021 through 2024 time period. I realize we are in a pandemic. And so just as we're discussing things, just keep in mind that, you know, we need to address what's going on now, but also, you know, post pandemic, what that might look like for the future. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces that have, are on the screen that have participated in some of the other meetings. So thank you very much for joining us again and providing your input. Um, and if you forgot to say anything at any other meeting, this is the time <laughs> to throw it in now, okay? So we are going to just start with general, um, and in the chat, uh, there's also an agenda you can download it and it has these questions on it. So we've got Deborah that's going to be joining us. Um, she's coming on right now. Welcome, Deborah. We just got finished with introductions. And so do you want to introduce yourself? And Thank you. Um, Deborah Sanchez with the City of Santa Ana and the Director of the Santa Ana Workforce Development Board. Thank you so much for participating. All right, so our first question. So what services and supports do job seekers need to help prepare for and find work? Um, again, we are in a pandemic, there's a lot going on. So you know, we can have some conversation about what we see now, but what, what do we see in the future and the things that we really need to be thinking about now as um, work is changing, you know, it's changing for a lot of people, the requirements that they need are changing as well as I feel like the speed of what they need um, is speeding up every day, right? So um, I will let anyone who wants to start go ahead and try in on that question. You can go ahead, Tanya. Thank you so much. I have worked with uh, adults, of course, and um, now pretty much the requirements are that they have to be computer savvy. They have to have experience with computer, internet, and um, whether they have uh, those skills or not, it's. Um, you know, it's crucial that they have them because you don't find uh, paper applications and if you do they're very rare so um, uh, downloading documents uploading documents um, submitting resumes whether it's through indeed or through any other job search engine um, composing um, composing cover letters those are the most crucial both the resume and cover letters so that as long as they're savvy, if they if they don't know how to attach those basic documents, it's going to be a struggle. Yeah. So I will say, Tanya, um, I think out of the six of these that we've done, and all six of them, digital literacy is, is one of the main things that have been discussed, um, a great need for that. So I definitely think that we're going to have to you know, work together to address that um, with our education partners. I know that some of the um, adult eds, there was one that in particular that's uh, spoken one of the last meetings that they were doing a digital literacy program that was kind of new. So any of our other education providers on here doing anything specific right now to assist in that area? Yeah, this is uh, Jason Ross from Huge Adult School. We have a full-time job developer uh, here. We're very lucky, even though we're not a large school. And she really provides a lot of one-on-one -on -one assistance. I mean, she does go into classrooms and do, uh, right now, Zoom uh, lectures or lessons on everything from how to land a to job interview to resume skill building. Um, but what we found is it's that one-on-one -on -one time, uh, helping students feel comfortable and confident. Uh, a lot of our students have an interview for a long time. So getting them to a point where they can reduce their anxiety, uh, teach them some mindfulness activities even, um, so that when they go in there, they're really ready uh, and to be their best self. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else um, planning anything? Michael, are you guys planning anything with adult school doing more around digital literacy?
Yes, uh, Coastline, uh, and it was talked about in one of our last meetings, we have college and career preparation um, where we try to address those issues to assess, you know, where their uh, technology needs and, and to better prepare them for workforce, of course. We're also developing um, smaller certificates that are non-credit, so meaning they're free to the, to the student. And those are focused on Microsoft Office Suite, like, you know, Word and Excel, um, uh, to give them general knowledge for uh, job seekers who are, for example, trying to be an accountant. So we are developing programs with, the, with those things in mind, um, but I, I would have them start at our college and career preparation course, which starts next week. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, like Michael mentioned, um, we have the college and career prep one and college and career prep two. The second course, uh, College and Career Prep 2, we focus heavily on uh, helping students develop a resume, a cover letter, help them identify um, possible majors that align with their career. So, yeah. All right. So, you know, I think for the most part, like I've heard, you know, about these various programs. Um, the library, I think it's doing some things, but probably just some general, you know, strengthening of just that basics of just being able to use a computer sounds like um, just something that's definitely needed. So we will work on trying to address that. What other services and support do you think that job seekers need to help prepare them for the workforce? Um, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in that a lot of our hospitality industry, um, food service workers, you know, have been impacted during this time. So they've been the most, you know, impacted. Plus they were making lower wages to begin with. And so how fast these jobs are gonna come back is the question, you know. So any thoughts around how we collectively serve these individuals and really try to help them advance on a career pathway? Um, move into higher paying jobs. Any thoughts around that? I think as well, the language barrier. Um, Coastline offers a, a wide variety of ESL program opportunities and options. But as you know, if you, if you struggle to speak the language, um, that's another huge barrier to your success and, and a pathway into a higher paying job. So we've been trying to mitigate that through our ESL programs for students that come to us with backgrounds in all languages, because a lot of times it's students who um, speak fluently, of course, in their own language and have trades in their own language and, and had businesses wherever they came from, but they can't transfer those skills because they don't speak English. So I think those are opportunities as well for growth. Okay, thank you. Brittany, um, how about with you guys? You, you're from the business solution side of it. So what are your employers saying? What are they saying that is needed or they're getting people that are just lacking in particular areas that we need to focus on? Um, I think for us, a lot of the individuals that we've been seeing, and we work um, primarily with um, Orange County Social Services, they refer their individuals to us, is a lot of people who were in certain industries, the industries just aren't thriving right now. I think that went back to what you mentioned about hospitality. Um, and it's just more shifting individuals' boxes and having them open up their eyes that they have transferable skills that they can take to a different type of position. So um, one thing that we've noticed is, you know, with offices not being open, there's a lot of individuals who maybe were in IT or HR and their departments were downsized. So trying to take those um, transitional skills and figuring out, okay, what industries are hiring where you can use those? Because um, the, the main areas that we still see that are thriving, like warehouses are thriving because people are buying stuff online and they need packers and things like that. But obviously somebody with like a higher skill set wouldn't necessarily be open to those positions. So we've been trying to look at what industries are continuing to grow um, where people can use those transferable skills. So that's what we've been noticing a lot of. So with those, those individuals, as you're trying to open their eyes to, you know, maybe jobs that fit 
the skills that they do have? Are you having any challenges with employers opening their eyes in a sense to saying, okay, you know what, um, this could be a viable employee based on those transferable skills? Um, It's a little bit of give and take. We have some really close relationships with our employers. So some of our employers um, are a little bit more flexible with what they're looking for. Um, We also have a subsidized employment program as well, which helps reimburse employees' wages. So sometimes um, our employers that are a part of that are a little bit more flexible as well, just because they are receiving the subsidy. But um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of um, a lot more coaching the employers as well as coaching um, our job seekers to kind of see what the best fit might be because things aren't fitting as easily as they were before the pandemic. Before, every it was just like, oh, you have this experience, you go into this job, but it's a little bit different now to where we have to get a little bit more creative. So it's a lot of convincing the job seeker that they have skills for a different type of career and then convincing the employer that the skills actually really do fit. I imagine that there is some give and take on, on, on both sides. And I think as um, workforce, as things change and um, the economy really is changing and the nature of work um, is becoming you know, more automated and so forth. Um, I think we really have to think about you know, how we train people with more um, stackable skills and, and really how we communicate skills to employers even um, as, as opposed to, you know, a traditional degree. Okay, well, this person has, you know, they want a four-year degree as opposed to maybe some experience in the field and just really how the, how things are looked at because I think more and more um, it's, we've got to be able to have people who develop um, creativity, resilience, because gone are the days like, okay, we're, you know, you stay in a job for 20 years, right? And um, you don't see a lot of that anymore. And um, I think as automation comes into play, you're just going to see things speed up, like technological advances speed up, right? It takes, it takes less time for something to be created. I mean, computers learn faster than anything. So we really can't compete with that. So at the end of the day, we really have to understand how these transformations are taking place and what are we going to do creatively to mitigate some of the damage from some of that. I agree that there are going to be jobs that open up as a result of it. So I'll just give you an example, even if you said driverless cars, right? Um, so maybe you replace drivers with a driverless car and these people now need to go in the work. So maybe they are the mechanics of these cars or the robots that are behind them, however that works. But if you can imagine if 10 people are replaced, you need 10 mechanics and probably not, right? So at the end of the day, the equivalency of the jobs created is not going to be the same as jobs that are eliminated. So um, I think it really is going to take us to um, think, differently of how we see even employment. Um, You have the gig economy that's coming into play. Are these good jobs? Are these not good jobs? Are these things that people take because this is all they can find or is this their preference? So those are just some of the things that (laughs) pop around in my mind. So um, I'd be more than happy to hear what anyone else thinks on any of those subject matters. Um, just to kind of, I know it's a lot to think about, but anyone have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, can I say something? Yes. Uh, sorry for showing up late, but anyways, about, I guess, like automation in the workplace and or, um, you know, I guess discounting warehouse work for, you know, people with higher skill sets. I would say that work's going to be there where there's always going to be physical labor kind of a thing. And, you know, like at our core, we try really hard to, um, I guess, emphasize, you know, a lot of things that you gain at the core, aside from like job experience is also, I guess, your team working skills, how you work with other people, how you manage projects and things. And 
I think that's what it's going to come to is we're going to have to adapt to a new working environment where we might be working coinciding with automation or they're going to find something like the automation isn't as effective mm -hmm. as let's say the person in the actual physical job. So like, let's say truck drivers, um, a truck driver, like at a warehouse, cause I have plenty of warehouse experience. He has to back into the gate. Um, he has to, you know, make sure the goods are there on time and the goods that are there in general. And I think jobs like that will always remain only because it's like it, it was mentioned at the beginning of the pandemic, the pandemic where it was essential work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we'll see a lot of the non-essential jobs, mm -hmm. maybe not in the restaurant, but let's say like the ushers at Dodger Stadium or um, call center representatives you know, we might see an elimination of those job fronts. Mm -hmm. But as far as I would say physical labor or even some computerized work that involves those labors, laborist jobs like in public works or even at the Orange County Conservation Corps, we'll still see jobs adapt to, I guess, the future. Mm -hmm where there also be humans in those positions. Yeah. Agreed. I think that there's definitely some jobs that um, cannot be replaced by automation. I definitely think that there's going to be some hybrid um, type things. Um, you know, who, who knows, you know, when this, this, these things are going to take place, but, you know, we're in another as they would say, industrial revolution, right? We're in another revolution and we're seeing things, we're already seeing even just in the COVID um, timeframe, companies speeding up that automation, right? And so um, there, there becomes, I think, a core of what definitely everybody needs to have the, those computer skills. I don't care what job you're in, if you're an auto mechanic or anything, it's, it's all has that component in it. So definitely got to be a core of it. Any other thoughts on um, the future of work and how we how we train people, how we might do this differently than we are now? I think for us um, at Equus, the way we're training individuals, I with how we've had to do everything so virtually through the pandemic, we weren't even doing anything virtual before. Um, I think it's definitely not something that will be going away. I think it just has shown how accessible everybody could be. So I think with training individuals, I think definitely going to a more online format, I think is going to be more and more popular. And I think there's also going to be some jobs that don't return to a typical office setting that are going to probably stay work from home. And I think that'll just help ready people more for that kind of a thing as well. So that's also something that we've been projecting. So Brittany, have you seen your participation increase? Um, it has in the way that um, we've been doing, before we used to do workshops that were a whole day long and on Zoom, attention spans do not last all day. <laughs> they, it's really hard to get people to be focused for that long. So we've actually um, made our workshops smaller but more frequent, and we've actually seen an increase in engagement in that way because I think it just um, has really helped individuals. They don't need to commute. They don't need to find child care. Um, the individuals that we work with are parents, and with a lot of the schools closed, obviously, they probably wouldn't be able to participate otherwise. So that has caused an increase in participation. So I think it's just helping those that if they had a reason not to come in, um, they don't actually have to physically come in now. They could just go online, which has been really, really helpful. And they're still getting a lot of really good quality information. So I don't foresee that a lot of places who are doing virtual services will probably stop. They may have people come back into the office, but I think virtual will always be something that a lot of people keep just because it is so much more accessible. I like the idea that it actually stays in some ways. Um, I think it does 
provide some individuals with um, a level of accessibility that maybe they didn't have. I also think that solely being um, online does provide a huge hindrance for some people, right? If you don't have the device to get online and if you don't have adequate internet service at home, you know, these are barriers that um, for people that, you know, that are real. We've, we've actually seen um, within the work centers um, and have tried to mitigate that with offering, you know, hot spots and so forth. So, but I do like that hybrid model of, you know, having that online access plus the in-person um, when we're allowed. Any other thoughts on that, you guys? How about the community uh, community colleges, uh, any of the education um, partners? What are you guys seeing? I mean, what do you think as far as um, the world of work? Are you guys trying to shorten programs and make them, you know, just rapid reskilling, doing any kind of rapid reskilling programs? This is Gabriel with Chrysalis, uh, a nonprofit. We're not um, in the education sector, but I just had a, a couple of the quick thoughts. Um, and, and working with the employers that we work with, um, some of the things that we look at as it relates to uh, candidates is housing, if, if they have a cell phone, if they have transportation. Um, so we really look at some of the, the, the basics, essentially, to make sure that they can stay employed with one of our partners. So it's really looking at the stability of that person um, ensuring that they have those basis, those basics um, taken care of. So we've been able to help with like Lyft and, you know, there's obviously like childcare that's, that's needed. So um, really it's, it's about setting up that, that individual for success long-term. And so thinking about what is it that's needed. And I think that's something that we all do need, right? Housing and food and to be able to get to work and back depending on when that, when, when that happens again. So um, just wanted to um, input. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the next one. So what types of training are most needed in the area? So what are we seeing there is a demand in? Um, can anybody speak to that? Um, I take classes at Rio Honda College for uh, computer information systems. And I would say the training there and other colleges that offer these programs is definitely worth it because you get maybe like a vendor um, approved certificate like CompTIA, A plus PC repair, uh, Security Plus, or even um, the other one is Networking Plus. Mm -hmm. And in those fields, because they're in such high demand and there's a lot of job growth as well as job opportunity in those fields, yeah. you, with maybe one year of training and getting those certifications, you can start making 60,000 a year and then it just grows exponentially to as high as let's say 300,000 a year. But as far as my professors say, because they're also in the field of IT and teach, I guess there's no such thing as more like a, you know, I guess a degree in like a internet technologies, like a bachelor's degree, I guess that'd be worth it unless you're going for something that specifically studied like cybersecurity mm -hmm. and ethical hacking. But as far as getting like, let's say a bunch of the workforce into those fields, it'd be, they wanna go for the low hanging fruit first, get their certificates and maybe like Amazon Web Services, uh, the CompTIA ones I mentioned. So a lot of cloud technologies, a lot of networking and they're accessible for all types of people. Agree. That's definitely still probably a good field to be in. Is that information technology, um, which has been a focus of the Orange um, Regional Planning Unit. Any other jobs out there you guys see on the horizon? Um, historically, we focus basically on hospitality, retail industry, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. Um, information technology and um, healthcare careers. Um. Yeah, I guess one of the best things I've learned, uh, probably not just at the Orange County Conservation Corps, but at school too, is, you know, don't put your eggs in one basket. Like, you know, we've learned with the pandemic, you know, 
you're here today kind of gone tomorrow in terms of, you know, your job. So, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to, I guess, start over from square one because it's that kind of role now. Kyle, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, so, so that brings up another good point of just being lifelong learners. You know, how do we get people into that mindset of being lifelong learners and continuing just to pick up skills? And um, I feel like we all, if we, we stop learning, right, we become extinct, like we become the newspaper that <laughs> the paper newspaper is gone kind of thing, right? So you know, how do we promote that within um, our region and, or are we already doing that, I guess, um, in the colleges or are you guys having those conversations maybe in your um, classes? I don't think we have those conversations enough, actually. You know, I talk about with my core members that, you know, drive with me in the same van, about like, you know, just because you're working at the core doesn't mean you know, you're just learning about the physical labor intensive jobs like public works. You can also take this opportunity to, you know, come with me after work and learn things like, um, you know, I do a lot of e-waste recycling after my hours in the field. So then I show them how to take apart computers, maybe re-image them so we can um, redistribute them among core members so they have a computer. So like another way to get opportunity, you know, have a computer to get education, get, um, look for job opportunities, things like that, you know. And so I guess, you know, when it comes to training and education, it's a matter of looking at the whole picture of, you know, I can do this, but I can also do that. You know, I guess being a master of all trades or jack of all trades, but a master of none. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kyle. This is Daniel Onofre. Okay. Um, just to touch upon one area, I, honest, I honestly think we have to, in the United States, especially California, you know, because we're here, um, we need to rethink high school. I think for the future of work, from ninth to 12th, you have four years there. I mean, you can integrate major licenses and certifications and think of a realistic path because right now everything's set in high school getting certain grades, certain things, you're going to graduate and you're going to go to either community college or university and so on, right? And that's the reality which doesn't work, especially all the unfulfilled jobs that are out there that they keep talking about. So if we rethink high school, those four years, there's stuff that like Colorado school districts are experimenting with, they're experimenting with that, you know, as a ninth grader, you could get in there and by the time you're graduating in 12th grade, you have FAA certifications to be a drone pilot. Um, legit ones to get in and get hired right after you graduate high school. I mean, they can take that to another level and go to community colleges, university and expand on that level. Um, even here, the culinary arts, right? If a kid wants to focus on that and they like that, then a realistic thing for in those four years to train them in the culinary arts, but also potentially to be a business owner, right? So you understand the, the kitchen front end, back end, um, how to be an entrepreneur if you're going to do that. Um, SBA loans, things like that. And we, we really, I think those four years can be really, you kind of rethink and reshift in the next, you know, 20 years. And I think it could really help the jobs in the future in general, starting at that level. Um, and just be honest, you know, that not everyone's going to go to medical school, not everyone, because there's a lot of good paying jobs that are out there. And we need to help students uh, on various levels to put those in front of them, look to identify areas and really help them throughout the process to where the full teachers, counselors at school, um, ourselves with workforce and other avenues really come together um, and support that moving forward um, on, on one level for the kind of youth moving forward. Another thing I see is you know, I read a lot about, the, you know, the way that Scandinavian countries do it, where private industry, like Siemens and all these big companies, um, you have skin in the game, right? Like you have, you're invested in workers. So because you're paying to set up employment centers and things like that in conjunction with government. So 
Um, and then when they finish, you know, a one, two year, or three year um, training apprenticeships, they have a guaranteed job and they can either stay with that company after a certain time or they can go to another company. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, a together approach between private industry and government and so on that they're going to be good paying jobs where it's not going to come out and, you know, truck driving, unfortunately, things like I remember growing up that um, my parents, other parents, you know, that I knew of friends that were, you know, bus drivers, OCTA, Orange County Transit Authority. Back then, you can, you know, you can be a, a bus driver, make good money and have a house and a good living. Uh, um, you can work at the Stater Brothers, a local grocery store, be a cashier and make a good living and support a family. Um, and now you can't. A lot of those jobs, such as truck driving, have been really squeezed and been diminished. So we got to rethink the, you know, especially with the pandemic, and we see how important those type of jobs are. And the ones that kind of people kind of don't think twice about uh, moving forward, they're always going to be there. So we need to rethink how can those jobs continue to make good wages into the future and not reduce wages as time goes on because for various reasons. So I think a, there's, there's a lot of factors, but I think those are just a couple of things that I've been thinking about. Thank you, Daniel. Does anybody have a comment? Um, I want to add something. Okay, go ahead, Kenisha. Um, I agree with everything that, um, that Daniel had said um, in regards to rethinking, you know, looking at the high schools. And it made me think of something. Um, at an old company that um, I had worked for, one of the things that they did, um, they had um, private, no, not private, um, they had industry sector panels where they invited the companies out to kind of hear what is it that they're looking for. And one of the things, especially um, we had an industry sector strategy with the manufacturing. And one of the things that they said was that the key problem that they were having was having someone that had like the basic math skills mm -hmm. and, you know, also the soft skills. So also addressing, um, those areas too is the soft skills because many times yeah we can help a person you know obtain employment but they don't have those soft skills like learning like what's appropriate and what's not appropriate um on the job or even having adequate training finding out from the employer what what types of trainings um do you feel that we need to to work together to develop so that you know once they're, you know, completed the training, then they can transition into permanent employment. So I think that that's something to look at too. Thank you, Alicia. Ryan, were you going to comment? Yes. Yeah, so um, I was going to say that um, some of that work's already being done um, that Daniel was referring to with the Orange County Department of Education with their OC Pathways Initiative. Um, and, you know, it's not there yet. Um, and, it's, and it's not really designed specifically for students coming out of high school going straight into careers across everything. But what they are trying to do is align curriculum from the, from the, from the high schools into, the, into our community colleges. I mean, we are really blessed with, um, you know, a wonderful community college system in, in California and certainly in Orange County. And I know we have some, some great folks on here from that. And so, um, you know, and that helps smooth the pathways into those careers. Um, and it also um, makes sure that the skills that are being taught are the skills that are needed. Um, in terms of what was just talked about with um, with um, career or with panelists and, and business panelists, that's actually a lot of what we do with the community colleges. Um, I can give you an example right now. We're doing a virtual automotive pathway experience for all the automotive programs at every community college. And we have about 275 students who are attending this virtual event over the next I think it's two weeks, three weeks um, with, uh, with, I think it's five community colleges and we have about 10 school districts and we're bringing in industry folks to talk to them about what are the skills you're going to need? What is your, what does a day look like in this job? Um, you know, I think, I think part of, um, part of it is, ex is um, setting realistic expectations for the, for the students. And then the last thing I would say is um, to, to Daniel's point, you know, I think, I think part of the problem in Orange County from what I've seen at Vitalink is um, business steps forward and says, we want this, we want this, we want this. And then when it comes time to hire people, 
or to um, you know put the put their money where their mouth is, they don't. Um, and you know I've seen this in in cybersecurity. Um, which was talked a little bit about earlier, where, you know, businesses say, I can't find anybody, I can't find anybody. And then I talk to students in cybersecurity and security and send them to them. And they come back to me and say, well, they said I didn't have the skills. And I said, well, they just told me that they would train you on some of those skills. And so I think there's a, there can be a bit of a disconnect between business and, and education. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of work to be done, but I, I do think some of this work is already being done. Um. Excellent points, everyone. Um, so one, Brian, you definitely, uh, I've got you on my list to connect with on a one-on-one to talk about some of this stuff when it comes to career pathways. Um, so so yeah, Daniel, there, there is some work that's going on. There's a lot more work to go on. <laughs> um, so the boards, so, so let me start from the state level. From the state level, um, the boards are directed basically to engage industry in these sector partnerships, okay? So that is one of the things over the next four years that um, the Orange Regional Planning Unit is going to be definitely focusing on working with our partners, one, who are already engaged with industry, um, and two, kind of strengthening those relationships and also trying to get into a position where they are actual partners. Um, each, I want to say, so you've got community colleges, you've got your ROP programs, all of them have some type of interaction with businesses on, a, on different levels. Um, some are kind of more advisory to where, you know, they bring programs before them and they kind of ask them, you know, for input on these programs that they've created. Um, what I would like to do is kind of reframe and elevate that to a level of where these businesses um, are really at the table constantly, telling us constantly, this is what we're looking for specifically. We go to our community colleges and we work with them to design exactly what it is they say they want and they are hiring them, period. Um, some of these partners could look like where, let's just say, I'll use the example of manufacturing you know, they may have specialized equipment that they need individuals to be trained on. So as part of this partnership, they may donate that piece of equipment to the community college so that it allows them to train people on these things. Um, you know, but ultimately they're at the table, they're constantly at the table, they're forward, you know, looking forward also within their industries and trying to give us a heads up on, okay, this is what we're seeing. These are the trends, this is directions things are going. So that collectively with education, the businesses, workforce boards, all the workforce development community that we are ahead of it, that we are not reactionary um, to some of the things. And there's no excuse, right? We give them exactly what it is they want. Um, and that they, they, they are a true partner though, you know, and that's where I would like to get to. Um, it's, it does take time. It take, I've seen it work in other areas, um, but it, it takes time. It takes years of developing these relationships. But I think there's, there is definitely a start. And I think we just need all the uh, key players to really come together and come up with that strategy of just strengthening that um, and moving in one direction. Because we do have multiple you know, your community colleges each have advisory um, advisory boards, right? Um, I know from Strong Workforce, one of their goals is to kind of have one big advisory board for all the community colleges in the Orange area. So, you know, there's, there's some things that uh, are being worked on, but definitely on the list, definitely on the list. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, let me see, I have group on the four um, Anne or Michael, are you guys doing any kind of rapid reskilling programs? Or they're just accelerated trainings?
Um, hi, I'm not really sure about that. I joined the adult education program um, a few months ago, so I'm pretty new to a lot of this, so I don't have anything to say about that. I apologize. No, that's fine. I was just kind of curious. So I, th these are some of the concepts that we really need to kind of work on. And there is um, Jobs for Future. They're partnered with Stanford um, D School and a couple of other entities where they did um, do an X Prize competition for rapid reskilling. They opened that up to. Um, Stanford students, MIT students who were already in the program, and then they opened it up to other organizations to put together teams to come up with a rapid reskilling um, programs that involve technology, ensured accessibility. Um, and then these programs are going to then be piloted in the Workforce Development Board areas. Um, we don't have one in Orange, but San Diego would probably be our next closest one. They will be piloting these programs. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of comes out of that. But their whole goal was to skill 500 people within 60 days. That's their, the, the challenge that they have. So, um, which is a big challenge. And um, I believe this started before the pandemic happened. So, um, you know, it's a Things have changed, so we'll, we'll see how that, that works out. I'm going to go to C. So do people, did, I'm sorry, did somebody want to add something? Oh, no, I just said thank you for that. Oh. <laughs> um, C, do people in the community have a good understanding of the programs and services that are available to assist them? If not, what is the best way to get the word out? What do you I guys think? think uh, <clears throat> Hi, this is Dennis from EDD. I think I on, on that particular topic. Um, you know, for many years, people have said the um, the work centers have been the best kept secret. We don't want to be a secret. We want everyone to know, and we want everyone to be available to uh, hear about, know about our services. I think a lot of the conversation uh, really centers both from the uh, education uh, folks and from some of the other uh, uh, partners around life skills, life skills training, and that's very important. And even in some of our centers, we have uh, uh, programs. Uh, I think the the PPP program and one of our centers where um, we try to initiate a bit of life skills into some of the uh, some of the program participants. And and I think that's really going to be one of the crux of the things that we have to do as a workforce. Uh, system. And, and I say system, meaning the whole system, and that includes the wraparounds as well. Um, here, do people in the community have a good understanding of the program? The answer to that, and, and, and I run some of the centers uh, here in Orange County from the EDD perspective and been a partner on all of them, uh, the answer to that is no. So what do we have to do about that? Because um, my, my biggest push from, uh, from an EDD perspective and from a center perspective is uh, we really need to do more business service outreach mm -hmm. from our centers. Um, you know, we don't want to be the best kept secret because, you know, with EDD, our number one customer is the employer. Now, that takes nothing away from the actual client. They're, they're right up there too, but uh, in, in all our uh, saying, the number one customer is the employer because those are the, the ones we can impact with the, the, the claimants or the clients that come to our centers. So I'm, I really think one of the ways we can get that uh, notoriety out there is more business service outreach. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we do at, at some of the centers is we have an, from EDD perspective, we have an active business service program and outreach services. And, and we've done that for, for, for a number of years. And, and I think that coupled with some of the other partners would be a way where we can uh, get the name out and, and make it as known as, 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 as the most popular thing. You know, people, people say, uh, uh, oh, well, the center's down the street and they can help you with uh, your job search. 
or your your re-careering is what we like to say a lot of times. Um, active business service campaign, which includes the, the workforce development partners, the workforce development board, uh, and, and uh, our local community. And um, one of the other things uh, that we can do to help get that those program services out there is any specific type of programs. I know in our center in Garden Grove, we've got uh, quite, a, quite a variety of uh, partnerships there from colleges to um, um, disabled services, DOR. So there's a lot of opportunity there to get the name out. Um, one of the other programs, Experience Unlimited, uh, that's a professional job club that we have in our centers. So that's in, that's, it's not in every center, but it's in a couple of them here in Orange County and in counties beyond as well. Uh, I think uh, Daniel's on the call and he, he's our coordinator for that. So that particular program, but that's where we take the business necessity and need and compare and, and put that with the professional client or claimant that comes into the center. Now, the way the partner gets in on this is the referral, the professional referral process. And I'm a big advocate of referral uh, processes in our centers so that when someone comes, this is, this is the, I think I hear our director, uh, our executive director talks about the one door policy, no wrong door policy. And, uh, you know, when Karma talks about that, that's really, that's really the way we want to operate. And I think if we do that, um, you know, I, I work on uh, cars. So when I need something um, that maybe this one vendor doesn't have, it's always easy for them to say, Dennis, this guy across the street has what you need. He can fix that particular item. And we wanna have something similar with our, with our centers and working with some of the businesses. And that's where an active vet program uh, and an active experience unlimited program, um, active referrals between many of the uh, partnerships. Those are the kind of things that I feel will We'll get our programs and services out there and people will know that they can assist them. Active campaigns don't hurt either. Uh, I think we did an active campaign a number of years ago, two, three years ago. And um, I think something like that with, with support from the, the Workforce Development Board would definitely be uh, an area where we can uh, find our best way forward in that particular area. Thank you, Dennis. You just got all this for me there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, agree, agree, agree. So uh, business service outreach is important. Um, so I will say that um, Orange County is currently going through some transitions to where they're bringing that in-house and in the process of hiring uh, business service representatives. And so I am looking forward to that being um, created and new programs being rolled out from that. With that said, you know, my goal is to work with uh, the other two boards, Marco and Deborah, to just kind of see one, um, how do we align some of those business services um, especially in, in an area where our boards, you know, they're, they're not, a, not a very big county, right? And so we have three boards. So one, businesses aren't shopping in that we're not communicating almost three different OJT programs in some Exactly, exactly. Um, we're not communicating three different business services programs. So it's just Santa Ana has this, Santa Ana has this, you know. So we need to, you know, kind of maybe try to, keep things pretty similar so that we can almost collectively hand them one flyer and this is what all of us do right and and go to the one that's closest to you and and we can I think do once we kind of get all that in alignment we can probably really hit the ground running to promoting the overall workforce development system to employers again, engaging them in a partnership with us, building those relationships. Um, we need employers on board uh, to help get these individuals part. We need healthy businesses. So I think as a part of business services, that should include that 
layoff, a strong layoff aversion program to where you're really trying to help them either avert layoffs and or grow their businesses. We need them to grow. Um, and, and that some of that may come with really trying to connect better maybe with our like SBA and looking at uh, helping them identify opportunities outside of the region and or country, you know, um, that could be some kind of import export type things that they could be looking at, but really helping so a lot of times, especially your smaller businesses, they're so busy doing the job, they're in it, that they, they're not, they can't grow it, right? Um, so really maybe helping them see how that could be possible and how there's some potential to grow their, their businesses and maybe in partnership with um, like a SBA, we could maybe do something like that. But I, I definitely agree with that, Dennis. Um, I, I, I put your name down next to my note, so I will be reaching out to you. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's where we, that's where we be, we have to be the experts for those small businesses and even those large businesses where, uh, like you said, once, and, and it doesn't matter if, you know, each entity, whether it's the colleges, the education piece has their business thing, uh, the, the, the county, EDD, it doesn't matter as long as we do what you just said. We, we align those efforts to get that message out and one message. I always have a saying uh, uh, since I've been working with the one stops is don't make my one stop into a two step one stop. <laughs> and that means don't, don't, don't send, don't give the information twice. Yeah. You, know, you can give it one time and uh, don't send the customer the customer comes to Garden Grove and you send them to Santa Ana. You, you don't want to do that. And uh, so okay. those are the things that I think uh, I look forward to us doing that because we're going to have to work differently now. Um, you know, the, with the pandemic and mm -hmm. it, it, there's, there's a saying of uh, my uncle, he, he was a veteran and he would always say, how are you going to, uh, he made this comment, I think it's from a movie or something. How are you going to keep the boys on the farm once mm -hmm. they've seen Paris? And, and, and what, what I take from that for our specific uh, situation is, uh, you know, people now have, the whole country's been teleworking. They've been doing, working very differently. Whereas in the past, we've often said, well, that's not really an option. Well, necessary circumstances and necessity have made it an option. So... Mm -hmm when people began to matriculate back to uh, their workspaces, we've got to think about that. I think I heard someone earlier, one of the education folks earlier talk about it. Uh, is it really going to be viable to have 60 people come into a one-stop center for a workshop? Why can't we do it uh, via Zoom like we're doing now? Mm -hmm. or, some, uh, or the things that we've been doing since, since uh, last year. So those are some of the things that uh, we have to look at. I know as uh, someone who runs a, a, a couple centers, that's one of the things that's on my mind when my staff get ready to matriculate back through. Hey, Dennis, you know, I've been doing this for a year. What do you mean I got to come in and do this? <laughs> so, so these are some of the things that we've got to put our, our, our head around as a, as a workforce system and see how we can manage those. You know, I, I definitely think that, you know, the Zoom and all that, it's, it probably has been beneficial for some. Um, and especially, you know, for those individuals who have a difficult time getting into the one-stop center, like it's created an opportunity that probably wasn't there. Um, and I, I do like the concept of keeping that. It's something that has always stuck with me from years ago, just from, it was actually from a customer complaint about uh, one of the workers. And, you know, she said, you know, she said, you're my barrier, you know, you are my barrier, oh, and we, oh we, sh <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> that was like the worst thing, and so we have to remember that, like, we sometimes have our processes and paperwork and <laughs> all of these things that people have to jump through um, it is a barrier for some, you know, we take for granted that we know it, and we think it's easy, but it's not always easy for everybody, and so, um, I definitely agree. We've got to re kind of rethink things and how we're we're providing our services. 
the one door policy is definitely something that we we need to get to. I think the referral part of it is yeah is our large hurdle. Um, we've been on some of these calls and even. I think it was adult ed. I don't know, Anne, if you know, or Michael, um, if it was one of your groups, but, you know, they, they brought up a whole nother system of referral system that they're starting to use and bring the community college in. Oh, yes. That it was one stop. That was actually Phil Villamar. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, excuse me. One flow, not one stop. One flow. The one flow is one a, flow. a data sharing information system that we can use to track the status of students as they move between the adult schools and the colleges. Yeah, so, so what I'm hearing is we all need to be on one system, but then what I'm seeing is everybody's moving towards different systems, right? So how do we, you know, again, to make that system work very well, you know, it's, we all have to kind of buy into something, right? And which, which is maybe we have, we have to buy into something, but we also have to make sure that while we're doing different systems for whatever uh, we're doing for our direct clients, we also have to build that bridge because uh, yeah. you know you, you can have you got three cities on the river and and if no bridge crosses that river, you, you lose a great deal. Yeah. And uh, you, it, with clients and uh, someone at the university or in the school education system, it, if that bridge of life skills and workforce and job training isn't there for them to cross, then they're going to stay on the education system. They're not going to make that transition. Uh, same thing for uh, you know, if it's someone who is in need of some type of life skills or, or skills to get them over to something else. I see that a lot in the centers where the person comes in and it's not just uh, they need a they need a job. That's probably fifth on their list of things that they need. <laughs> so, yeah, it, definitely. Um, I don't know. Maybe we need a work group around that or something because that there's a there's a lot around that referral system because we all are using it. You know, we got Cal Jobs that has some referral components to it. Um, You've got an organization called Unite Us that's coming in under Kaiser that's actually bringing in a system to Orange County that they're wanting everyone to use, and including community-based organizations. And they're doing this in like Northern California. They're actually even saying that they're interested in building the bridge to other systems. Kaiser's paying for it. Um, it's not gonna be no cost to anyone within the community, but you know, again, as people start using systems like OneFlow, once you get in it, it's kind of like, okay, I don't want to go over here and start using this, right? So I think that there's definitely, we've got to right, dig in our heels on this one and really kind of figure out the best way to do a referral system. And then you've got even um, HMIS, homeless, you know, service, they've got their system, right? Unite Us is actually building, like there's some big players in the HMIS field where they are building that bridge with those systems, those large systems um, that are being used in multiple states. So we, we can definitely have some more conversation about that offline. Um, I'm gonna go to D. do you guys, anybody else wanna chime in on that before I move on? Just, just one of the ways to get the word out as well is, um, this, and I think the, uh, I've seen some of the, the other workforce development boards do this as well, our surveys to the employer and the client. And uh, one of the things that I think we really sleep on is uh, success stories. The best way to get the word out is to say, hey, look at me. You know, Definitely. You know, I, I, I got a job and this is how I got it. And those are the things. I know that works quite well with our veteran programs where it that particular getting the word out success stories is actually built into the DOL's uh, uh, platform. So yeah. that, that works quite well. That's definitely, I can tell you even from the business services standpoint, you can engage other businesses by getting those business testimonies that have used the system and have been successful. Yeah. Businesses listen to other businesses. You know? So agree, I will put that one down to I'm going to call you later, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Are there specific gaps between the services that are available and services that people need? If so, how can we bridge those gaps? Anything that stands out that you feel like is really lacking in this area? I'd like to mention something. Yes. Um, since the pandemic, um, the soft skills, they just kind of got dropped. I know it's harder to interact with people when you're not, um, you know, you don't have that person to person interaction, but with any job seekers that are struggling with their skill level, with their education level, that becomes a big factor when looking for or applying or going to interviews, if they have in-person interviews. Um, some still do, some don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that could be a, a, a problem. Um, job searching, not only because of the pandemic, but because some, I don't know, I, I think that, you know, maybe uh, somebody earlier mentioned about high school, you know, some of this stuff should be um, just like you have a government class or an economics class, there should be something in there that, you know, says, how do you present yourself when you go to an employer? Somehow it goes bouncing between, well, the parents should do it, um, and the parents think, well, the teacher should do it because it's part of education and preparation. But instead of tossing the ball back and forth, it should just be done because as previously stated, um, high school students just don't come out and all of a sudden they they have a trade in their mind. This is the demolition man. This, you know, this just doesn't happen. And most of us that have gone through school, we've stumbled through probably different careers, different paths to end up where we are. And it's lucky for the student that graduates and has some type of mentorship or even an internship where they can even if they're allowed, if they're not isolated from everyone else, where they can actually interact with the staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what is it like for students who have parents in blue collar jobs and they want to be part of the workforce, but they don't know how to get in or how to navigate through schoolings. And I know some community college teach that, but as somebody else mentioned, a lot of students don't you know, they fear. I mean, the college is a big word. Even for some of us professionals, I know plenty of um, people in my networking circle that, oh, they are not thinking about college. And I'm like, why not? This is the time, you know, this is the time where like, you're just at home. Why not? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and unfortunately not, I agree with you, uh, Miss Annette, that I think People should continue to pursue learning. People should be learning more. It just doesn't happen. You know, it's, people are always thinking of, oh my God, the time and the commitment. And this would be an incredibly perfect time being that you're not commuting to work, you're not driving. I mean, I don't know if you are, but you know, I think, um, and like Mr. Dennis said, a lot of times people go to EDD because they either have uh, to file for unemployment, there's nobody to talk to on the phone, they're not answering the phone, so they get, you have people going into uh, EDD offices and one stops being upset because they can't get a live person. And again, there's that live person interaction. And so they go in there and they have no idea that the services have been there all along for them. And they're just floored because they're like, wow, I just never knew. We know because this is our field. This is where we work. This is what we've done for probably a lot of uh, many years. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know why. Yeah, I, I think that maybe if it was announced um, on a newscast where like this is a service in your local community, they're having job openings or they're having a job event. You know, when people are watching the news, you hear about everything else, but you don't hear about community resources. Right. I, I know I that's that's. It. That's probably too much to ask, but I'm just thinking if people know what time the news are, people are going to sit there. I mean, they should be there. And when, and, and I'm sorry, I just want to finish off. And when they have the news, I mean, it's like a little five, 10 second snippet and boom, it gets taken down, you know? So that's a problem. Yeah, agree. I think we need YouTube ads instead of. <laughs> <laughs> maybe our younger people, I, I don't know that they 
I think they're on their devices more than they are on actual TV, watching different types of media today, right? Absolutely. But, but I, I definitely get your point. Uh, you know what? One thing that maybe we'll, we'll see as um, this year starts rolling around, uh, the mobile training unit. So Orange County um, purchased a mobile training unit. So it's going to be a one-stop on wheels. It basically, it has 12 computers on the inside of it. Um, it has a screen on the outside where they could do workshops on the outside. So this mobile training unit is going to be used um, to do some outreach and hopefully reach one communities that aren't close to a one-stop center, get the awareness out, but also try to bring this to kind of partner agencies in different spots in the community to bring more awareness to the workforce development system. Um, I'm really hopeful that um, it will help in that area also just be a help in reaching those who are underserved or unserved um, in that. So that may roll out in February. It is ready to go. They did kind of push back the timeline a little bit because of the pandemic. So possibly in February, that'll, you'll start seeing that in the community. Um, but yeah, so the soft skills, got it. Um, I think another gap uh, in services uh, that are available and, and what the services people need or want, and this deals mostly with budgeting and the supportive services. Uh, I think when people come in, a lot of times they do want uh, bus passes, gas cards, uh, or some other type of you, you, uh, need, utility need. And we, of course, in the past, we have either had some of those items or we referred them out. And so I think if there are any gaps, and, and I know it's really mostly to, to do with funding, if the partnership or, or whoever provides those actually have that budget for that particular thing, uh, that particular cycle. So I think if we, if we can try to bridge some of those gaps, and if that's purely a funding thing and, and how, mm -hmm. um, what's available. Uh, we have we have things for vets when they come in that we can provide, and the partners have things for uh, clients as well. So I think um, the way the only way I know to bridge that gap is just more funding on those particular items. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I think you know from the county maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Karma know. <laughs> I definitely think there is you know, some needs there. Does anyone else, like at the adult schools or do you guys provide bus passes and things or do you kind of rely on that partnership with um, the workforce boards to do those those types of services? Um, at Equus, we do. Um, if a case manager through SSA deems that it's necessary, they send a referral and then we do it on a referral-based service. And we do budgeting with them and go over all of that to ensure that, you know, they could plan for it the next time, just because the services are really limited. Yeah. But on education side, do you guys provide anything? Michael used to wear? Yes, I'm still here. Sorry, my neighbor has construction going on. So it sounds like a war zone over here. <laughs> um, do you guys do bus passes for clients? No, we, we don't do bus passes or anything in that area of transportation, but what we do provide are Wi-Fi hotspots if students have um, access barriers for internet. And we've also provided uh, Chromebooks to help um, that for those that are lacking technology. We had a lot of students that were trying to do the work on their phone. And as you can imagine, that's not very easy with college courses. Um, so yeah. those are the areas we focused on but we also provide them resources. So, um, you know, if they have uh, issues with food, we have a food bank at the college, um, obviously more prior to the pandemic, but we would collect uh, uh, those type of things to help students or at least point them in the right direction if we didn't provide the resource directly. Okay. Um, do we still have community action partnership on the line? Okay. I, you know, for the most part, Dennis, I really think workforce development is the, the only one that really has the most supportive services dollars. And I agree that there's more needed because yeah. um, typically the partnership and the co-enrollment is that with workforce development is to try and help support students and stuff um, with 
those types of resources, whether it be childcare, bus passes, mileage. Um, so, and, and, the state, and the state typically does provide those type of things in, in their grant system or, or yeah. things that are available for the workforce development areas to take part in. And yeah. It, it's just a, a gap area that I see a lot of times at the different centers. We'll see, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, pro they're proposing big changes, um, not only at the federal level and the state level for a state to put in money into the workforce development system. So we'll see if any of those <laughs> things come to pass in, in the budget. I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, you know, sure that, that they will, I think, uh, with the, some new leadership at the Department of Labor. And um, yeah. I'm pretty sure we're going to see some different uh, things reaching out. Yeah. Okay, you guys, it's 331. Um, I don't I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So please feel free to jump off. I'm going to ask one final question for anybody who just wants to it, throw anything out there. So if you guys were writing the local regional plan, what would your priorities be and why? Anything that you guys want to add to that, that you think that we should be focusing on? So, so in that plan, uh, I would put uh, some type of program related to life skills coaching. Um, I would also put, um, um, and again, how to network and look for work. I think the previous uh, person on uh, that mentioned something similar to this, uh, that kind of keys into the, 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 how do you look for work? Uh, and these programs, we have some, uh, but I, I do think it's one of our priorities. Um, and also expectations in the workplace, um, uh, know what they are. And that, that gets along with the, I know uh, some of the programs we have or, and have had in the past. So some of the priorities are make sure that the clients or the people who are utilizing our service uh, know um, they, they actually have the life skills to work and search for work. Uh, they know how to network and look for work. That's what we teach them at the centers. And um, um, know what the expectations in the workplace are. I think the education uh, partners are, are pretty pretty good at helping uh, um, folks understand the expectations in the workplace, and, and so are the centers as well. So mm -hmm. I, I, those are some priorities that I, I know uh, I'd like to look at when okay. from our centers. Hmm. Anybody else? I have something to mention. Um, I don't think anyone's ever considered how many women have had to leave their jobs because they have no childcare. And I think that um, it would be a great opportunity for us to reinvent the wheel where um, women can be working from home so that they can save, um, you know, they can focus on their children. Um, children after all, besides being our future, they definitely are going to need the most support and the biggest foundation. So who better than, than um, a parent who could potentially be there at home? Uh, and from my personal experience, yes, it was very scary at first. And it was a roller coaster of anxiety having, uh, you know, having to ho hover over um, a classroom, an online classroom. But as time went by, you know, a lot of us were surprised we're very happy that they have been able to become a little more independent. They're clearly a lot brighter and they are so much more adaptable than we are. But um, I definitely think that maybe uh, uh, employers can take that into consideration, um, providing support for those parents that may have to stay home, whether that is, that is the, the mother or the father, and, uh, and have offered that flexibility uh, as we are now, flexibility if you have children to care for or feed or anything else, you can just do your work after hours or as long as you have a work uh, deadline and submitted by a certain time. Um, I think if anything, that has made us possibly better people, possibly better parents, possibly tighter families. And that way we can, um, we can all grow from this. I think that family, the family unit will be, um, pro will probably benefit from this and if we are to learn from this is that um, 
you know, that moms, unfortunately, we can't split into two. And, uh, and that's something that maybe employers can consider that, you know, just because you decide to have a family, you know, you can have that flexibility. You don't have to be, um, you know, in, in a room or in a cubicle um, from nine to five. You can have that flexibility as long as the quality of the work is there. You know, I think that would be wonderful. I agree. Child care definitely is an issue, an expensive issue, right? Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that one time, but definitely something that, uh, you know, the work, the workforce areas, they can provide child care assistance when someone's in training. And so there, there's some options there, but really doesn't extend into, you know, kind of the workplace. So no, I mean, what I meant is by not that the employer has to be providing that service, but that the, that the employers are mindful and that they're willing to be flexible in this time when we are restructuring the wheel, have the possibility that, yes, you have the staff and some of your staff may have children to take care of. So maybe some of your staff can be flexible or can have flex time. And uh, instead of maybe paying hourly, just pay salary and that way as long as the work gets done you know that's all that matters I and mean, that's the quality work and not on time you can't do that with you know kindergarten and side your side 24 7 so um i think that flexibility from the employers is the main key here understand understand okay right. this is daniel yes daniel. um i think with me it'll be um the first thing i would look at three areas first thing i would look at is um strong for the local and region plan, I would look at strong um, collaboration with the state of California because I'm excited how workforce services were moving to the Department of Better Wages and the Jobs. They created a new department that's moving forward um, to do a more um, comprehensive with apprenticeships and so on that Governor Newsom has talked about. So I think a strong relationship with the state level and what's available there. And uh, as you mentioned, um, a little, hopefully a little more funding into the future from the state level because about 50% or a little bit more comes from the federal level, uh, from WIO and so on, other, other areas. Um, so I think working strongly with the state and obviously in conjunction with the federal level would be um, definitely one. Um, the other one would be is identify, you know, Orange County and see the top three or five employers, right? You see hospitality, healthcare. And in most areas, you can kind of see in the high percentages of the top three to five. So I would look at those to identify those areas and bring those um, major players like Disneyland, Marriott, whoever it may be. Um, uh, it might be um, the UCI and uh, other hospitals, Kaiser and so on. Bring them to the table to figure out um, their needs for the future because they are major um, employers. And how can we work together to create a plan of, as I mentioned before, um, Everyone's invested to bring the, the, the workforce that the employer needs, but they're also investing in the opportunities such as working together with the, the community college levels or other areas to, to educate or bring these skills up to par. And the third thing I would say is, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, equity and being equitable, right, for the, 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 the regions and the communities. Which ones have been you know, with systematic racism and other things going on, that's that's a reality. How can we work to, in the future, lift those communities up, uh, identify these things to fix them uh, within um, business plans and government and so on to lift up those uh, communities that that are more vulnerable, especially we see in the pandemic, right? People that, you you know, mentioned childcare and other areas um, where they can't work from home. They have to go to work. Um, and they're more vulnerable to lift those communities up because overall lifting those communities up with you know better wages and you know longevity in their jobs that they're not just disposable they can just oh we'll we'll fire that person and just pick up someone else um, there's a true investment um, we'll lift up I think the region as a whole um, when we do that so I think those are the three areas that I, I can kind of see. Thank you, Daniel. Um, definitely, Dennis. Do you know? So I know that it didn't make the last budget round for the new department. So I'm sure it's in the budget this time. Does that look like it's gonna move forward as far as the uh, work? I don't, I don't even know what to call it, but it's a long name. 
a workforce wagers and something. Oh, are you talking about the the new the new transition to the new agency? Mm -hmm. The Department of Better Jobs and Wages. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's still going on. Uh, it got kind of threw off a little bit from the from the uh, pandemic. Uh, it was supposed to happen last March, last July actually was when it was supposed to happen, July a year ago. And, uh, but um, we've been in, in some different circumstances now, and, uh, but it is still a top item on the agenda for our uh, agency. Okay. And so yeah, so we'll see if that, if that actually that transition happens. There's definitely um, in, the, in the proposed budget, uh, some large sums of money that, um, are planned about 25 million into the high roads training ship partnership um, strategy model. Um, we've got about 15 million from Prop 98 that's uh, for apprenticeship programs, another 20 million from Prop 98 that for work-based learning. So these, these are state fund dollars that they're proposing in the budget. I'm, we'll see if it makes the cut, but- um, and, and they're part of the, the apprenticeship uh, uh, Area is part of the or one part of the the combined uh, yes or, uh, agency. So yeah, um, sure so a, a, I a, a vested interest there. We're gonna see. I think we're gonna see some big changes coming up in the next few years. So um, some positive changes for workforce development. I think uh, it requires we, we it requires a lot of money. I think we're there's a huge transition just in, in the world period so i think to get people reskilled res upskilled all of this i think that um we've got a lot of work to do and it does require um money and partnerships and all of that so um i want to really just thank everyone for their input and being on if there's any final things um please let me know uh, you know what i will share my screen one more time just so that you guys can grab my contact information um and if you have any aha moments, you can send them to me. I would be more than happy to hear what anything, what anybody has to say. And I'll also type, in, type it in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Thank you everyone.